So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. The President of the United States is one of the most powerful people on Earth. He's also a target. We cannot afford to lose another president. Agents understand that's an awesome responsibility. That makes the 176 square kilometers of Washington, D.C., the main battleground in his protection. The latest weapons and technology vital to his safety. And the men and women who protect him, the last line of defense against disaster. When a single mistake can be devastating, the Secret Service has to be faster, tougher, and smarter than any potential assassin. Plan A and Plan B aren't good enough. You need Plan Z. Failure could cause catastrophe. If there was no Secret Service, the president would probably not last outside the White House one day. The White House is one of the most secure fortresses in America and the main focus of the Secret Service. That's really our home field. We own it, we control it. With 1,300 agents, snipers, and uniformed guards, the Secret Service has the White House covered. But they take nothing for granted. Every time you drive in through that northwest gate and the gate closes behind you, there's always a sigh of relief. Before each new president can settle into the White House, the Secret Service has to get him there. January the 20th, 2009. Reserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. A record-shattering crowd watches Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States, take the oath of office. As history unfolds live, the eyes of the world are on the president, but the eyes of the Secret Service are on the crowd, scanning for the tiniest detail that could signify a threat. It is as high stress as it gets. But you don't really have time, ironically enough, to focus on the stress of the actual job. Former agent Daniel Bongino was part of Obama's protection detail for two years. He was a key player in planning the inauguration. It's kind of like being a baseball player in the World Series. You keep thinking about being a baseball player in the World Series, you're going to stress yourself out. And there's no time for that. You just do the job. This job begins 18 months before the election as Barack Obama ignites passions for and against. The Secret Service came in far earlier than they ever had in the past. But then again, they never really had somebody with the enormous crowd appeal that Senator Obama had. Thank you! Police see a 400% increase in threats against the new president, many of them vicious and racially motivated. One white supremacist website enlists 2,000 new members the day after the election. With President Bush, the Secret Service was concerned about a terrorist attack. With President Obama, they are more concerned with the threat of a lone gunman who is motivated by racial hatred. As the inauguration approaches, a credible threat puts everyone on high alert. Some want to cancel, but this 200-year-old American institution must go on. Former agent William Albrecht has worked at six presidential inaugurations. It'd be great if we could just cordon off the entire area six blocks out from the White House, throw up a wall, that's it, no one in, no one out, unless we say, well, that's not America. That'll never be America. The inaugural parade will make the ceremonial trip as planned, taking the president the 2.4 kilometers from the Capitol to the White House. It's a pretty standard inaugural parade route, but that presents problems because everybody knows where the president's gonna be at that specific time. Almost two million people are expected. The biggest single crowd ever in Washington, D.C. And among them, intelligence reports say, may be a potential assassin. The danger zone is broken down into more controllable sections. I was one of the site agents for the parade route on the inauguration. I was responsible for one of those sections. 
Bongino oversees an area the size of three football fields. With 16,000 people per block, he has his work cut out. The preparation is meticulous. Bongino's team scours every square metre of his section for bombs, weapons and hiding places for gunmen. Post boxes are removed. Manhole covers are welded shut. The Secret Service even removes doorknobs from rooms overlooking the parade route. But Bongino is only one part of a massive operation. Thousands of Secret Service agents are in the crowd. 8,000 police officers from across the country double the usual size of the DC force. More than 12,000 military personnel are on duty. On every rooftop, snipers scan the crowd. Their rifles accurate to almost a thousand meters. But to stop an assassin, communication is key. There's a reason that your piece has become symbolic of the Secret Service. It's the most valuable piece of equipment you have. You have to be at a very specific spot at a very specific time. And you're being directed by a supervisor who's like a director of a movie. You have to hear him in that earpiece. It enables you to function and properly protect the president by being in the right place at the right time. The director sits in the command center, receiving information from satellites, as well as electronic and human intelligence sources. Anything important is immediately relayed to agents on the ground. They could say, hey, look for a guy in a red shirt and jeans. Well, that certainly narrows down your targets. And those are the kind of things an intelligence apparatus, a good one like we have, can do for you. 3.23 p.m. The inaugural parade begins. For much of the route, President Obama and the First Family waved to the crowd from behind the armored windows of the new presidential limousine, nicknamed The Beast. But the nation wants to see their new leader. 41 minutes after the parade begins, Obama gets out of the car. If a lone gunman is waiting, this is his moment. It could be anyone in the crowd. Everybody is a potential threat. The agents have to guard the president and his family, but they also have to consider any innocent bystanders. If you, God forbid, had a shooting to a crowd of people, you better be accurate. And you better know what you're shooting at. Accuracy and responsibility for every single bullet that comes out of that gun has got to be a priority. To limit collateral damage, the Secret Service needs specially designed weapons that are deadly accurate. International Training Incorporated, West Point, Virginia. Former Navy SEAL and weapons expert Ken Good demonstrates how the needs of agencies like the Secret Service have changed weapon technology. The Secret Service may choose to deploy fully automatic weapons. In this case, we have an MP5 submachine gun. Easy to deploy, easy to swing, easy to conceal. Exceptionally reliable. In the past, Secret Service agents have used a variety of submachine guns. The MP5 has exceptional firepower, but in large crowds, that firepower can be a serious liability. A block of ballistic gel shows what happens to an MP5 bullet as it enters a human body. In a real-world situation, any innocent bystanders behind the target would be wounded or killed. In 2003, the Secret Service switched to the FNP-90, a small-caliber machine gun prized for its advanced design. Looking at this system, you can see it's very compact. I can easily conceal this weapon system. It's a bullpup design, which essentially brings the barrel back into the receiver and actually ejects the empty casings out the bottom, so a left- or right-handed shooter can deploy this weapon system easily. The FNP-90 has the same capabilities as its predecessor, the MP-5, with one key difference, custom ammunition. 
take a look at these two particular rounds. The 9mm is a heavier, lower velocity, round nose projectile. The 5.7mm round is essentially, if you look at it, a miniaturized rifle cartridge. Good demonstrates the capabilities of the FNP-90 specialized 5.7mm round. The rounds leave the muzzle at over 700 meters per second. Unlike the MP5's heavier 9mm rounds, which pass straight through the gel, the FNP-90's bullets lodge inside it. The key is their special design. The rounds fragment upon impact, reducing their velocity and distributing their kinetic energy within the target. In theory, the FNP-90 can eliminate a would-be assassin with minimum risk to civilians. But no agent wants to have to prove that in the real world. If you're pulling out a weapon from a holster in front of the President of the United States, chances are something has failed in the entire protection apparatus. Daniel Bongino has almost got his charge back to the White House. But with the new president out in the open, there's still plenty that can go wrong. And this is only his first day of office. Go on to Chicago and let's win there. When a single bullet can bring America to its knees. The Secret Service can't afford to make mistakes. Their main fear, that one potential assassin, that one fatal shot. Today, agents control every aspect of the president's movements outside the White House. But there was a time when they didn't think twice about letting him wave to an unscreened crowd. March 30th, 1981. Gunfire rings out. A bullet hits its mark. President Ronald Reagan. I heard the shots. I'll think I'll probably hear those shots until the day I die. The gunman is John Hinckley Jr., a disturbed loner looking for attention. Veteran agent Jerry Parr is the man in charge. That day I was responsible for everything. That's what you trained for, was that one moment. Leaving a scheduled appearance at the Washington Hilton, President Reagan and his team are just 10 meters from his limousine. As they pass directly in front of the crowd, Hinckley takes his chance at glory. With gunfire still ringing in the air, Jerry Parr pushes Reagan into the car. When an attack on the president starts, cover first and evacuate second. That's exactly what happened on the day we're talking about. Either you do it or you don't do it. There'll be no time to mess around with it. The Secret Service doesn't tolerate uh, uh, subpar performance. They just don't. The people who are put next to the President of the United States are, are usually the best of the best. Agent Timothy McCarthy becomes a living shield and takes a bullet in his stomach. If you look back at some of the video, the Reagan incident, you'll see what the guys did. They made themselves big, not small. They made themselves the target, those guys, and that was an unbelievably noble mission they accomplished that day. Making yourself big is completely counterintuitive. No one thinks like that. It defies genetics and self-preservation. It's only through rigorous training that it's possible to overcome the powerful instinct to flinch at the sound of gunfire. If it breaks bad, your muscle memory kicks in, you go with your training, and this is it. It's a muscle memory, and you do this over and over and over again, time and time again. And when that moment comes, God forbid, you are going to react in a certain way. He did what every agent knows they would like to do. He stood there and took that bullet. That would have certainly gotten me or the president. And I've always loved him for that. It reinforced our training. It reinforced our response to danger. You're going to cover the president and get him out of there. Hinckley fired six shots in 1.7 seconds. Shot fired. Shot fired. 
Parr is already racing towards the White House with the president in the limo when he realizes that Reagan has been hit. He started spitting up bright red frothy blood and I made the decision to take him to the hospital. Go on, Drew. Roger, we want to go to the emergency room. Oh, the door is wide and fast. Roger, Sergeant, stay on, The president's limo makes a wild turn towards the closest hospital, losing most of the motorcade, and arrives three and a half minutes later. Jerry Parr got the motorcade to uh, George Washington Hospital. I would credit him for saving Reagan's life that day. Agent McCarthy recovers from his wounds and receives an award of valor. The Secret Service changes its tactics in response to the Hinckley attack. Perimeters are further back. The agents are better trained in techniques like protective operations. The Washington Hilton, where Reagan was shot, has built a brick garage specifically for the presidential limo. Only one person, a Secret Service advance agent, is allowed in the garage before the president arrives. And only after the garage doors are shut behind the limo is the door to the hotel opened. In all other locations, the Secret Service has implemented sterile arrivals and departures. No one other than authorized agents are allowed near the limo. We had always known arrivals and departures were our most vulnerable. The attempt on Reagan drove home that point. So now what you will see is all arrivals and departures are either going to be underground or in a tent. Tents block lines of sight for any potential sniper. It's sad that we have to do this, but it is a fact of life. You think about the Reagan incident, we looked at what went wrong and we changed our policy after that. One thing I always liked about the Secret Service is they don't say, hey, we know better than you. Even with protection, the commitment's there. They want to always improve. They have their work cut out for them. Protecting the president becomes a lot harder when new threats can put a whole city under siege. On September the 11th, 2001, as two towering symbols of American power crumble into dust, the Secret Service realizes the scope of its mission has radically changed. When the towers fell and planes slammed in the Pentagon, Secret Service realized at the time that the threat of terrorism was acute. And so they would have to adapt, and they would have to expand, and they would have to use new technology. The Secret Service expanded the perimeter around the White House significantly. Those perimeters now extend much further than they used to, and they're not just horizontal perimeters, now they're vertical perimeters because you have to worry about airplanes and perhaps other kinds of weapons that can be fired from much greater distances. The Secret Service now monitors White House airspace up to 18,000 feet. It's rumored that the White House has anti-aircraft missiles and possibly even a Dazzler a green laser that would blind an attacking pilot. But some threats can't be shot down or even seen. Up until the Clinton administration, the only nuclear threat the Secret Service planned for was full-scale attack or a reactor meltdown. But in 1995, an attempt in Moscow to set off an explosive with radioactive material attached changed the playing field. A so-called dirty bomb could spread deadly contamination across a city and be easily smuggled into Washington. There's no question from a security perspective a dirty bomb is devastating. Just psychologically speaking alone, the idea of nuclear radiation in the air, with you breathing it in, would cause mass panic amongst the populace in general. The Secret Service has plans for that. They have rehearsed that scenario. They know what to do. The one thing to know about the Secret Service is what you see is not always what there is. And quite often, there's a lot more to a security plan than what the public is able to see. The Secret Service would be among the first to know if any radiation was detected in the air. And if the president was in the White House, he would likely be taken to an underground bunker. But in this new world, 
the threats may be less obvious. Biological and chemical weapons attacks are of more salience now, and the Secret Service has spent time figuring out how to detect minute traces of potential contaminants, but also how to respond and where to take the president. The Secret Service now needs to have the ability to handle every possible kind of attack, including chemical and biological. Each member of the president's detail carries a chem bio kit to prevent him from inhaling poisons or contracting deadly diseases. A special team to deal with radiation or chem bio attacks is never more than a few meters from the president. As a last resort, there's a highly specialized doomsday plane, a $223 million modified 747, separate from Air Force One. Thermal radiation shields protect its passengers during a nuclear strike, and it can remain airborne for days without refueling. Inside, 75 tons of advanced electronics keep the president in touch with the rest of the world. No matter what the situation, training, weaponry and technology are important. Exact planning is crucial. But the fate of the president ultimately lies in the hands of the men and women of the Secret Service. It's a very simple, simple job. Keep this man alive, no matter what. They put aside their politics. The Secret Service used to say, you elect them, we protect them. Doesn't matter what his politics is. He's the president. Their families. There's not an agent out there that hasn't questioned who is more important, your job or your family. And quite truthfully, it's always the job. They're willing to sacrifice everything. My life, his life. At one moment, everything changes. I was totally responsible for his life, and that's what you carry when you're agents of the Secret Service. In the face of constant threat, they are the president's human shield. The Secret Service protects the executive office of the president of the United States, a symbol of everything America stands for. What better target for an assassin? The Secret Service has to deal with that every single day.